Today we're discussing inhomogeneous media. And specifically, we're going to limit ourselves to the one-dimensional case because these are fairly difficult types of problems to solve. Most of this course is devoted to solving Maxwell's equations in simple media, media in which mu and epsilon are constants. Now we can put together different media and have interfaces or boundaries between them. So overall we have an inhomogeneous um, system, but it's composed of piecewise simple media. But today we're going to look at the case where mu and epsilon, or specifically we're really going to look at epsilon, can be a continuous function of position. So let's start off uh, by assuming that mu is just equal to mu zero, so we won't worry about magnetic effects. But epsilon is a function of position. We'll write this as epsilon zero times epsilon relative of position r. So that's the dielectric constant is a function of position. Now consider Faraday's law, which says that the curl of E is minus j omega mu, and mu is mu zero, times h. And let's take a curl of both sides. So we have the curl of the curl of E is equal to minus j omega. Mu zero is a constant, so we can factor it out of the curl, um, just as we can with the minus j and the omega, and then we're left with the curl of h. Now, if we assume also that we're in a source-free region, so that j is equal to zero, then Ampere's law is the curl of h is equal to, there's no j, but then you have little j, omega, epsilon, E, and remember that epsilon here is a function of position. So we'll substitute that into the right, and we'll use the identity for the curl of the curl of E, that that is equal to the gradient of the divergence of E minus the Laplacian of E. So that'll be equal to, over on the right, minus j omega mu zero, and the curl of H, we substitute j omega epsilon e. So minus j times j is 1, so that gives you then, you get two factors of omega, so omega squared, mu 0, and then epsilon, we'll use this form here, epsilon 0, epsilon relative of position all times e. And now we're going to rearrange that to move this Laplacian over to the other side. And then we'll end up with the Laplacian of E plus and omega squared mu epsilon zero. We call that beta zero squared. So Laplacian of E plus beta zero squared epsilon relative the function of position times E is equal to, and what's left over on the other side, is the gradient of the divergence of E. Now, we got to be careful about that. We know that in a source-free region, the divergence of D is equal to zero. There's no free charge density. But the divergence of D is going to be the divergence of epsilon E. But epsilon is a function of position, and therefore it takes part in the derivatives that represent uh, the divergence. Now, let's step back a minute and just look directly at the divergence of E. The divergence of E is the x derivative of the x component plus the y derivative of the y component plus the z derivative of the z component. So if each component does not depend on the corresponding coordinate, then the divergence of E would be equal to zero. And an important special case, the one we will look at, would be where we have an electric field, 
which is um, polarized in the x direction, so it has only an x component, and it only depends on the z coordinate, right? And this would be coupled with the fact that the epsilon relative would be a function of z alone. So in that special case, which is the one we'll look at today, it's rigorously true that the divergence of e is equal to zero. But more generally, if we look at that relation right there, we can expand that out, and that can be represented as epsilon times the divergence of e. So it's like the first times the derivative of the second, and then plus the second times the derivative of the first becomes plus e dot the gradient of epsilon. That's got to be equal to zero. And so we can solve that for the divergence of e. The divergence of e then is minus e dot, so move this term to the right, divide by epsilon. So the gradient of epsilon over epsilon. And that's like the, the remember that the gradient is, a, is the rate of change uh, with respect to position of epsilon in an arbitrary direction. So we dot product that gradient with a certain displacement and we get the rate of change in that particular direction. And so that divided by epsilon, that's like the fractional rate of change of epsilon. So if we have a very smoothly varying medium, we can at least approximate this divergence as zero. So we can say if the gradient of epsilon over epsilon, the, the norm of that, the magnitude of that, say is much, much less than one, is very small. Or let's just say, just more generally, is very small. Okay. So the case we're going to look at with, uh, with the electric field and epsilon relative are both functions of z alone will rigorously give us that the divergence of E is equal to zero. More generally, more complicated problems, uh, this is a good approximation if the dielectric constant varies quite slowly with position. So in either case, we're left with the equation of the Laplacian of E plus beta zero squared epsilon relative of position times e is equal to zero. And for the special case that we're going to look at, where epsilon relative of position is a function of z alone, and the electric field has only an x component, which depends only on z, um, this equation then reduces to, well, there's no x or y dependence, so this is the sum of second derivatives there, so it just leaves the second derivative with respect to z of ex plus beta zero squared epsilon relative of z times ex is equal to zero. So this is a homogeneous equation in ex, the right side is zero, but it has a non-constant coefficient. This coefficient here is now a function of position. So we know how to solve things like that. We have a general method, the power series method. Oops, sorry. So let's, uh, let's look at the case where the dielectric constant is a linear function of z. We'll write it as a plus b times z. And what we're particularly going to be interested in is a case that would look like this, where here's z, here's epsilon relative of z, and it has some constant value for z is less than zero. And it has a constant value for z is greater than w. And in between, it 
ramps up linearly between those two values. So this would be a case where we had a smooth transition between discontinuous values of the dielectric constant. We know that if, if W was zero, so that if we just go, let's say this is, let's, is a specific example, let's take this is, is equal to one and this is equal to four. If we just go from a dielectric constant of one and then suddenly to four, we know that we get a reflection coefficient, which is a to two minus a to one over a to two plus a to one, where a to two would be one over the square root of two, uh, one over the square root of four, which is one half, of the impedance over here uh, of a to one. And so we could calculate that reflection coefficient. Now what happens, at, our question here is, what happens if we make this transition smooth? So then send, instead of a discontinuity, we have a continuous transition between the two values. So that's what we're trying to answer. So our equation would look like with e of x a function of z, we'd have e x double prime plus beta zero squared epsilon relative of z, which, and let's plug in what that is, that's a plus bz times ex is equal to zero. Now, it's convenient to define uh, a new coordinate so that it cleans up this expression a little bit. So let's, let's do the following. Let's define a new coordinate u such that that this expression here, beta is zero squared times a plus bz is equal to some constant c times u. And doing that, we'll have a new function. So e x of z will become f of u. Okay, so it's just gonna make our, doing the power series method, it's just gonna make the algebra easier. So in doing that, if we look at um, a derivative of ex with respect to z, so d by dz of ex of z, well, over on the right, we'll have to use the chain rule. We will say that's equal to, what is the z derivative of this? Well, it would be the f derivative, uh, I'm sorry, the u derivative, d by du of f of u, and then we'd have the chain rule, du dz. And what is du dz? Well, here's our expression that defines u. So u is equal to beta zero squared over c times a plus bz. So du dz is just the coefficient of z here, which is beta zero squared b over c. Now, if we do, so, so what that tells us is that ex of z prime, where the prime here means a derivative with respect to z, is equal to f prime of u, where that prime means a derivative with respect to u, times du dz, which is this expression right there. Beta zero squared b over c. So what if we do two derivatives? Well, every time we do a derivative, we've got to add a factor from the chain rule of this expression in brackets. So ex double prime of z will be f double prime of u beta zero squared b over c quantity squared. Now, so let's plug that in to our original equation up here. So we're going to get beta zero squared b over c quantity squared f double prime of u. So we just substituted for ex double prime this expression right there. And then we get, well, our beta zero squared a plus bz, we said that's equal to cu, and then times ex is f of u. Great. Now what we want to do is choose this value of c so that this constant is equal to that constant. Then we can cancel it. So that gives us that c 
is equal to this guy squared would be beta 0 to the fourth b squared over c squared all right so that gives you that c cubed is beta 0 to the fourth b squared and finally we'd solve that c is equal to we'll take the cube root of both sides so it's beta 0 to the four thirds b to the two thirds if we take that condition then our equation reduces to f double prime plus u f is equal to zero So the equation we're trying to solve is f double prime plus uf is equal to zero. We're going to use the power series method. So from our lecture on differential equations, we'll represent f as the sum n equals zero to infinity, a sub n u to the n. And then in that lecture, we showed that f prime is then the sum n equals zero to infinity n plus 1 a n plus 1 u to the n and f double prime is the sum n equals 0 to infinity n plus 2 n plus 1 a n plus 2 u to the n so we plug those expressions in to our ODE and this is what we get the sum n equals 0 to infinity n plus 2 n plus 1 a sub n plus 2 u to the n plus then our f but with a factor of u so that makes this the sum n equals 0 to infinity a sub n u to the n, but then another factor of u, so u to the n plus 1, is equal to 0. So it's convenient in this term to make the substitution replace n by n minus 1 so that this results in u to the n, just like over here. So if we do that, that'll be the sum of n equals something to infinity. Replace n by n minus 1, so a n minus 1 u n minus 1 plus 1 is u to the n. Now this starts at n is equal to 0. This is u to the 1. So the first power has to be u to the 1. That means n has to start at 1. Great. So that's our equation now. So what do we do? We go through and we look at all of the coefficients of the various powers of x. So x to the 0, what is the coefficient? Well, in this term, the lowest power of u is u to the 1. So you only get a u to the 0 uh, term from this expression. That's when n is equal to 0. So that would be 2 times 1 times a2. So 2 times a2, and that's got to be equal to 0 because when you combine the entire coefficient for any particular power of x in this power series has to be equal to the coefficient on the right, but the coefficient, all the coefficients on the right are equal to 0. So this gets you that a2 must be equal to 0. Now, for higher powers of n, n equals 1, 2, etc., you'll get uh, contributions from both of these terms. And so in general, what we'll have is from the first term, n plus 2 times n plus 1 times a n plus 2. And from the second term, we'll have a n minus 1, and those have to add up to 0. And so from that, we get that a n plus 2 is equal to minus 1 over n plus 2 n plus 1 times a n minus 1. And finally, it's convenient to replace n by n minus 2 in this, so that this says a sub n. So we'll do that here. a sub n, then, is equal to minus, replace n by n minus 2, so this becomes n, and this is n minus 1. So 1 over 
n, n minus 1. And again, n is replaced by n minus 2. So this is a n minus 2 minus 1 or a n minus 3. So in that form, it shows that we leapfrog two coefficients every time we apply this. So for example, if we start, say with a0 is equal to 1, then this expression will give us a3. a3 will be minus 1 over 3 times 2, or minus a sixth uh, a0. So we'll get a3. And then, of course, a3 will give us three more, a6. And a6 will give us a9, and so on. So we'll get all the um, multiples of three for the indices starting at a0. Now, if we start at a, say, a1 is equal to 1, then this will give us three more than that would be a4. So that assumed value for a1 will give us an a4, and then a4 will give us th three more on the index, a7, and then a10, and so on. And of course, a2 is equal to zero. So a2 is equal to 0, and therefore that will be equal to adding 3 to, to 2 is a5, and then a8, and then a11, and so on. All of those coefficients will be 0. So interestingly, this breaks up into two solutions. We can take this to be a solution where we start with a0 is equal to 1, and a1 is equal to 0, so these are all 0, and of course these are all 0. And so we just have these coefficients that are a sub a multiple of 3. Or we could set a0 is equal to 0, and then take a1 is equal to 1. And then when we get this solution, where all these coefficients are a multiple of 3 plus 1. So let's do that. If we take a0 is equal to 1, and A1 is equal to 0. Let's call that result F1 of u, and it'll look like this. The sum, we can write it k is equal to 0 to infinity, will have A0, A3, etc. So we can write that as A sub 3k. Okay, so we only look at every third coefficient and we'll have u to the 3k. If we take a0 is equal to 0, and a1 is equal to 1, let's call that result f2 of u, and we'll write that as the sum k equals 0 to infinity, a sub 3k plus 1, so that's a1, A4, A7, etc. U to the 3K plus 1. And these are clearly linearly independent solutions because they involve different powers of U. So we, this gives us two linearly independent solutions. So if we have F double prime plus UF is equal to 0, the general solution would be F is equal to say C1, F1 of u, let's explicitly write this as F of u, plus C2, F2 of u. So we have a general solution. So what do those functions look like? Well, we can go to the computer and actually calculate these so, and plot them, so let's do that. So here's a Scilab program that is going to calculate these functions f1 of u and f2 of u. And these are set up to be vectorized functions so that u here can be an array of u values. So it's very convenient for making plots. And then it'll re return an array v, which is all the corresponding f1 of u values. And then also the derivative of that vp v for v prime. So here, this is going to be f1. We start off with a0 is equal to 1. We'll just use a to represent all the coefficients because uh, we'll do this iteratively. And so initially v is equal to a times u to the zero power. 
So that's just going to be a bunch of ones. The derivative of that would just be a bunch of zeros of the same size array. Now we sum over k, and we'll do k is equal to 1 to k max. Right here we've got k max equals 32. Remember, n is 3 times k. We're doing every third um, subscript. And here's our formula for the recursion to get the next coefficient. The new a is equal to minus 1 over n times n minus 1 times the old a. And so we add in then to v, v plus a times u to the n. And for the derivative, well, the derivative of a times u to the n is n times a times u to the n minus 1. So we add that in very simply for the sum that will give you the derivative of v. Okay. And this is a uh, series in which the terms oscillate positive and negative because of this minus sign. Every coefficient is positive, then negative, then positive, then negative. And in that case, a good bound, a conservative bound on the error is given by just the last term. And so we just print that out and we look at uh, particular, the worst case will be when u is the maximum value of out, out of this array. So that gives us an error bound. And for f2, we do the same thing, except this is now a1. And so v will be a1 times u to the 1. And the derivative will be a times u to the 0. And then again, we go through the same k is equal to 1 to k max. And now the n is 3k plus 1. And then we do the same calculation. So look at the, the error bound. And then we're just going to plot that here. So if we run through and do that, here's what we get. Here's F1, the blue curve. And here's F2, the dashed red curve. And roughly, F1 looks kind of like a cosine, and F2 looks kind of like a sine. But we notice that the amplitudes decrease as U increases, and the spacing between the zeros decreases. So the functions get more scrunched together as we get to larger values of U. Now let's use these ideas to solve the problem we alluded to earlier, where here is our dielectric constant. And for negative values of z, right here is z is equal to 0. It's going to be 1, let's say. And for positive values, to start, it would be 4. So if we had just this, this would just be a simple discontinuity between two half-infinite media. And we know over here on the left, the impedance would be a to 0, ratio of mu 0 over epsilon 0, which is about 377 ohms. And over here on the right, eta would be root mu 0 over 4 epsilon 0, which would be 1 half a to 0. And in that case, we would just have the simple normal incidence result that we've studied before, that the reflection coefficient, rho, would be eta, one-half eta zero, minus eta zero, over eta, which is one-half eta zero, plus eta zero. And the eta zero cancels, and then you end up with one-half minus one in the numerator, that's minus a half. And 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves in the denominator, and that ratio is minus 1 third. So that would just be the normal incidence discontinuity uh, reflection coefficient. But now we want to make things more interesting and have a little transition region here between 0 and w. So in that region, epsilon relative is going to be a plus b z, and we can write that down explicitly now. When z is equal to zero, the epsilon relative is one, and then when you get up to w, it's got to increase by three to become four, so that would be one plus, we can write it this way, three over w times z. And then it, z is equal to w, it's one plus three is equal to four. Now, what is going to be the reflection coefficient in this case? We'll have an incident field here. We'll have a reflected field down here. And we'll have a transmitted field over here. And we're going to have these more complicated relations in between. So let's see. First of all, let's figure out here that 
this tells us that A is equal to 1, and B is equal to 3 over W. So what about the field in that transition region? Well, that's the problem we just solved. So let's say we take our incident field to be polarized in the x direction, amplitude E0, and we go E to the minus J, beta 0, Z, and the corresponding magnetic field would be pointing in the y direction, amplitude E0 over eta 0, E to the minus J, beta 0, Z, or beta 0 is just omega times the square root mu 0, epsilon 0. And then over in the transmitted region, we'd have E transmitted. Well, let's do the reflected field first. Let's write the reflected field as E reflected is going to be also polarized in the x direction, a reflection coefficient rho, E0, E, and it's, it's propagating to the left, so that's E to the minus minus or plus J beta 0 Z, and the H, well, because this field now is propagating in the opposite direction, we keep the electric fields all in the x direction, the magnetic field flips 180 degrees, that gives us a minus sign, so it's minus A Y hat, rho E0 over eta 0 E to the plus J beta 0 Z. And the transmitted field, we'll write that as AX hat, transmission coefficient tau, E0, E to the minus J. And let's see, the beta over here will be omega square root mu 0, 4 epsilon 0. Square root of 4 is 2, of course. So that'll just be 2 times beta 0. And we'll refer this phase to the plane z is equal to w, so we'll write it as times z minus w. So at z is equal to w, this is a phase of zero. Transmitted field, magnetic field, ax hat, tau, e0 over the impedance in that medium, which is eta zero over two, same phase factor, Okay, and now the new thing is, what about in this intermediate or transition region? Well, so let's call um, this field E is equal to A hat X EX of Z. And that's going to include any field components propagating to the right, or propagating to the left, because what we derived was a general solution of the Helmholtz equation in that linearly varying dielectric constant medium. So that includes any combination of rightward propagation and leftward propagation. So we'll write it that way, where Ex of Z we'll write as E0, so everything is referenced to this amplitude of the incident field. And then our general solution, C1, F1 of U, remember U is related to Z, plus C2, F2 of U. Okay, so that's going to be the field in that transition region. Now, what's the magnetic field? Got to be careful. This is not a plane wave. This is not an E to the minus J, beta Z, Z type of behavior. This is a more complicated type of function. So we got to go back to Maxwell's equations. We go back to Faraday's law. Curl of E is minus J omega mu, and in this case mu is mu zero, times H. And that allows us to solve for H. By just solving that, we get that it's J over omega mu zero, the curl of E. And that becomes J over omega mu zero. The curl of E when E has only an X component that depends on Z, that curl will have only a Y component and it'll be the Z derivative of EX. And so with that, our magnetic field is gonna look like 
it's going to be something in the y y direction so it'll be h y of z is j over omega mu zero e zero and then we're going to have the derivative with respect to z of this function well we're going to use the chain rule to get that. It's going to be the derivative with respect to u, then times the derivative of u with respect to z. We already figured out how to do that. So it'll be c1 f1 prime of u plus c2 f2 prime of u. And then the chain rule factor, which we saw, was beta 0 to the 2 thirds b to the 1 third. And we know b, right, is b is 3 over w. Now, we have to meet our boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are that z is equal to 0 and z is equal to w. So, we, at all these points, we have to have ex continuous and hy continuous. That gives us two equations at each of those boundaries. So that's four equations in all, which is good because we have four unknowns. We've got rho, we've got tau, and the C1 and C2. So let's look at uh, z is equal to zero first. And recall that u is defined by Cu is equal to beta 0 squared a plus b z and we saw that uh, we wanted to take c to be equal to beta 0 to the 4 thirds b to the 2 thirds so we can use this to calculate when z is equal to 0 what is u we'll call that u is equal to u 0 and we can punch in uh, the numbers for that to get u0 and we find that it is equal to putting in the values of uh, of b which is 3 over w that this is beta 0 w over 3 to the 2 thirds power and then as z is equal to w we'll put w in here we know what a b and c are and you calculate u is equal to u w which is equal to, well, the only difference is, right, at z is equal to 0, a is 1, so this is 1, and at z is equal to 3, uh, I'm sorry, z is equal to w, b is 3 over w, so this just becomes 1 plus 3 is 4, so it's just 4 times the u0 value. So, let's see, the boundary conditions right there are what? Well, the electric field will be if we divide everything by the, this is why we include a factor of E0 in all of the fields, so that later we can divide by that, and then it just normalizes everything to the amplitude of the incident field. So if we do that, then the incident field is 1, the reflected field is rho, and the field in the transition region, the electric field, is E0 is canceled out, so it's just C1, F1, u0 plus c2 f2 u0 how about the magnetic field so the magnetic field is the incident would be 1 over a to 0 and the reflected because when it reflects remember the magnetic field flips 180 degrees so it would be 1 minus rho how about the magnetic field? Well, the magnetic field in the transition region, that's this expression up here. So we just evaluate that at u is equal to u0, and that's j over omega mu0, beta 0 to the 2 thirds, b to the 1 third, c1 f prime 1 of u0, plus c2 f 2 prime of u0. And that's why when we wrote that code to calculate f1 and f2, we also included calculations of the derivatives because we're using, using them here. Okay, so that would be the boundary conditions there.
What about the boundary conditions here at Z is equal to W? Well, let's see, in that case, the electric field, once you've divided out the E0, has an amplitude of tau, and the electric field in the transition region is C1, F1 of U, W, plus C2, F2 of U, W. The magnetic field is, in the transmitted field, is tau over eta zero over two, and then this expression, well, we just substitute uw for u0. And so that's equal to j over omega mu0, beta 0 to the 2 thirds, b to the 1 third, c1 f1 prime of uw plus c2 f2 prime of uw. Okay, so a lot of a lot of math, but that's okay because we're going to put this on the computer and let the computer solve it. So we can rearrange these four equations and put them in the following form. One is equal to minus rho plus C1 F1 of U0 plus C2 F2 of u0. That's this first equation up here. We're just moving all the unknowns over to the right and the knowns on the left. The next one we can write as 1 is equal to rho, and we'll multiply through by the a to 0 here, um, plus j a to 0 over omega mu0, beta 0 to the 2 thirds, b to the 1 third, C1 F prime 1 U0 plus C2 F2 prime at U0. And then for these two equations, uh, there are no knowns in that, so we have 0 on the left is equal to minus tau plus C1 F1 of UW plus C2 F2 of UW, and I've run out of space, so I'm going to put the, the next one. Actually, let me, let me do this. Let me move this guy over so I have room for two equations here. So 0 is equal to minus tau plus C1 F1 of U. W um, plus C2 F2 of UW. And then for the magnetic field, the version is 0 is equal to minus tau plus J A to 0 over 2 omega mu 0, because the impedance is A to 0 over 2 in, that, in the transmitted medium. Beta 0 to the 2 thirds, B to the 1 third, C1 F1 prime at UW plus C2 F2 prime at UW. Okay, so there are four equations in the four unknowns rho, tau, C1, and C2. So now what we do is we just put that on the computer, plug in the actual values of uh you know the a and the b things and then we calculate the actual u zeros and uws and then just solve these this linear system of equations for rho and tau and c1 and c2 although we're only interested in rho so let's go to the computer and look at that so here we have our code as before we've got our f1 and f2 functions defined and we uh, here set the beta zero um, and of course, that's 2 pi over the wavelength. And so I'm going to just take the wavelength to be one, 1 meter. Just that'll be kind of our, we'll refer everything to that. And we're going to look at a W minimum value of 0 0.001, 1 millimeter, and a maximum value of 2, 2 meters. This is our number of coefficients again. So down here, what we're going to do is we go through and 
We're going to look at uh, omega values, I'm sorry, W values from that minimum to the maximum with 101 points interpolated in between. And A rho is going to be the uh, reflection coefficient with uh, for this linear transition uh, type of system we have here. And then we set up a matrix. Uh, and this just initializes it. And the B vector, those are those known quantities. We, for the electric fields, we had ones. And for the magnetic fields, we had zero. And then we go through for each of these W values. We calculate uh, U0, uh, UW, um, a factor D, which includes the beta zero and the W over three, the one third power. I'm just calling that constant D. And then we calculate the, the values of the F functions and the derivatives at both u0 and uw, and then set up, these are just the elements that go into the matrix, or all the, the different things that multiply the, the row, the tau, the c1, and the c2, solve the linear system, and then just pull out the reflection coefficient, and then this just plots the, um, that reflection coefficient, uh, which we'll take as the, just the absolute value. It'll be, in general, complex. We're just looking at the magnitude of it. So let's do that, and here's what we get. So here is at as W goes, and this is would be, of course, W divided by the wavelength, since we took the wavelength to be 1. If you want to do this for any other wavelength, that's any other frequency, everything would just scale appropriately. So let's see. For W goes to 0, we see this goes to 0.33333, or 1 third, right? So we said the actual reflection coefficient is minus a third, and the magnitude would be 1 third. As W increases, as this transition region gets larger, the reflection coefficient drops very rapidly at first and then more gradually. So, and there's some little wiggles there because there's kind of a resonance effect as you get, you know, goes to a half wavelength or a full wavelength, et cetera. There's some interference effects. But in general, this tells us that the more gradual the transition is between two different dielectric constants, the less is the reflection coefficient. And if we took this to an extreme limit uh, where this transition region was very, very long, we'd expect to see the reflection coefficient drop down to near zero. Our observations from that uh, numerical experiment tell us that if the transition and the, the rate of change of the dielectric constant is very, very small, the transition is very gradual that we can basically neglect reflected fields. And this leads to a formalism called the WKB approximation. And so here's the idea. We've got epsilon is epsilon zero times epsilon relative of Z. We'll just do the case of one dimensional variations. And we're gonna assume that our field and is there, there's no reflected field, so all we have is transmitted field. In other words, the field is just always flowing to positive z values. And it has an x component, ex of z, which we'll write as a of z times e0, e to the minus j, some phase of z, and the magnetic field, hy of z, we'll write as uh, well, let's just write it this way. We'll just write it as EX of Z over eta. But now eta is going to be a function of position. And so eta of Z is simply the square root of mu zero. Right? We assume that in this case, mu is just equal to mu zero everywhere over eta zero, eta relative of Z. So this just says we're going to assume that basically we have a plane wave such that its amplitude slowly varies as we move through this medium. And the ratio of the electric and magnetic field also slowly varies uh, in terms of this varying impedance. All right. So now if there's no reflected fields, so we assume no reflected field. And of course, since we don't have a discrete uh, discontinuity anywhere, 
our incident and transmitted field are really just the same field. We just have this field that's just flowing down along the z-axis. And if it is, there's no reflected field and it's a lossless material, which we assume, I'll just put that here to point that out, lossless medium, then the pointing vector must be constant because there's nowhere for power to be reflected or lost. And so what would the pointing vector would point in the z direction, pz of z, and it would be one half the real part of uh, E cross H conjugate. Right? And so what is that going to be? Well, that's just going to be one half. Right? So this times the conjugate of that, well, when you conjugate E to the minus J phi of Z, you get E to the plus J phi of Z, you multiply them, they cancel out. So we're going to get magnitude E zero squared. And then A is just a real amplitude, so that we just get A squared of Z. And we assume, because it's lossless, eta is real also, so it'll just be eta of Z. And that must be equal to a constant. So if that's true, then what we can do is we can say, well, A squared of Z over eta of Z has to be equal to whatever its value was at z is equal to zero. And let's take our e zero such that a of zero is equal to one. Right? So just set up e zero to be the amplitude at z is equal to zero. So then a of zero is equal to one. And then we get an equation then for a of z. That gets us that a of z is equal to the square root of solving this guy square root of eta of z over eta zero. Now all that's left to do is figure out what the phi of z is. And that just says, if the impedance goes up, the amplitude goes down. If the impedance goes down, the amplitude goes up. So how about the phi? How are we going to get that guy? So Let's realize that if you have plane wave e to the minus j beta z, and we call that e to the minus j phi of z, then the phi of z would just be beta z, and d phi dz would just be equal to the beta. So we'll use this as an approximation in the case where it is not just a simple plane wave, but we actually have this varying impedance so that phi of z is not simply a linear function of z, but it's just slightly varies from that. So we'll assume still that d phi dz is equal to beta, which is omega root mu zero, epsilon is epsilon zero, epsilon relative of z, all right, which we can write also as beta zero, square root of epsilon relative of z. And then the actual phase, phi, well, we, this is the derivative, so we just get the phase by doing an integration. Phi of z then will be, if we start at zero, it would be phi of zero plus the integral from zero to z of beta zero, square root, epsilon relative, uh, and we'll use just u for our dummy variable of integration. And so those taken together give you the WKB approximation, which is a good approximation if the dielectric constant varies extremely slowly. Slowly with respect to what? To with, res with respect to a wavelength. So if it, you've got to go many, many, wavelengths before you see a significant variation in the dielectric constant, this is going to be a good approximation.